But as I mentioned in the previous lecture, the good news about weather forecasting is there will always have to be a human component. There will always have to be a human component. And so um, unlike many jobs in, in modern days that could be automated out eventually, the fact of the matter is, is that human instinct is a key component of making weather forecasts. And so for this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the ways that we as humans make weather forecasts. So how do we interpret the models that we saw in the last, in the last lecture? How do we take those models and then make meaningful forecasts out of them? Well, the first thing is forecasts go bad because those models are approximations and they make assumptions. Again, like any model, you're taking a very complex thing and you're whittling it down. You're simplifying it. You're taking away complexities and that makes it easier to use. And unfortunately, the more user friendly it is, the less complex it is, the more prone to error it's going to be. So there's a little bit of a compromise that we have to make. And that compromise is creating different models that have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, for example, um, some models do a really good job at forecasting rain events. Other, mod other models, such as the privately owned USL model, do a really good job at forecasting local winds. Other models do a really good job at forecasting for one location and not so well for another location. And so each of these models has its own talents, its own strengths, and its own weaknesses. And the joke I always like to use, and I have this graphic on my, um, on, in my office, includes these three models here, our commonly used models, the ECMWF, the GFS, and the NAM. And each one of these models has its own strengths and weaknesses, though I like to jokingly say that the NAM is the Ralph Wiggum of the three, whereas the ECMWF is the super studious, well put together, most accurate model. And this usually is one of the more accurate, one of the more heralded models. The GFS, somewhat as studious, but very nervous. And as you can see, peeking over at ECMWF. And then the NAM, a lot of times, is just out to lunch. It's just doing its own thing, you know, making up its own ideas. But the idea here is that each one of these models has its own strengths and weaknesses. And so humans are needed to identify, okay, um, the NAM hasn't been doing so well lately, so I'm going to disregard its output. But man, that ECMWF, it's been nailing it recently. It's been nailing it recently. And so we have to look at other ways that we as meteorologists can make forecasts. Now, one of the ways is interpreting those models, looking at how they've behaved recently, um, how far they've been off. So for example, if let's say the ECMWF has predicted, has been off with temperature by five degrees every single day. Well, then all we have to do is say, okay, well, take whatever the temperature is and add five degrees to it or subtract five degrees. Um, but some other easier to use forecasting techniques that are tried and true um, are these non-model forecasting techniques. And these can be done simply by looking at current conditions on your phone or a tiny bit of digging. These don't involve um, using forecast models. The only problem is, is that they only work for your local situation, and there's a lot of errors with them. And the first type of model forecasting is called persistence. And so in a persistence forecast, whatever is currently happening is expected to continue to happen. It's expected to persist. So the idea here, let's suppose that the current temperature outside is 72 degrees. According to a persistence forecast, it will remain 72 degrees outside. It will stay 72. Or if let's say the high today was 72, then a persistence forecast would suggest that it'll be 72 tomorrow. So basically, whatever the current condition is, it just stays the same. It just stays the same. 
Now, believe it or not, this is actually a really good model for short-term forecasts. So let's say you were looking outside and you needed to decide what you were going to wear and you're leaving the house in 30 minutes. You look outside and it's cold. And so you grab your jacket. You, believe it or not, have just made a persistence forecast. You have predicted that, okay, it's really cold outside right now. I'm going outside in half an hour. I need my jacket. You have actually just predicted weather conditions from, you know, for 30 minutes from now. And chances are, you're actually going to be right. So think about that the next time you're dressing for the day and you're thinking about the weather for the day, you are actually making a persistence forecast. You are actually a meteorologist. So, you know, if you're saying science is your worst subject or you're not good at it, man, you, you're awesome at it. And, and yeah, so that's a persistence forecast. Now, the problem with persistence forecasting is it's good in the short term. Like I said, if you make that prediction for 30 minutes now, nine times out of 10, you're probably going to be right, or you're gonna be close. Close enough to where it was worth grabbing your jacket. However, the longer out you go, the less accurate a persistence forecast becomes. Why? Because weather changes. Weather changes are very sudden, but long-term weather changes can be much greater. So for example, um, I am recording this at 5.38 p.m. on Wednesday, June 13th, 2018, if you wanna know exactly when and where I was recording this. Um, so I'm, I'm recording it at that time. And if I were to make a persistence forecast, so whatever the temperature is outside now, it's gonna stay that way. And let's say I predict for four hours from now. So let's say it's 75 degrees outside and I say it's gonna be 75 four hours from now. Well, between now and four hours from now, which would be 9.38 p.m., I'm pretty sure the sun is going to set. And as the sun sets, the earth cools. And in fact, chances are more likely that the earth will be cooler then than it is now. So persistence forecasts become more erroneous over time. They're great for the short term, but not so good in the long term. And so, they have their use. Now with that said, something that could be useful for a little bit longer is what's called a trend forecast. The idea here is you've observed a change. So now you have two data points. So for the persistence, you had one data point. What was happening right now? For a trend forecast, however, you have two data points and you observe a difference between those two data points. That difference is called the trend. It's the change between those two data points. Well, a trend forecast assumes that that trend is going to continue. So rather than weather conditions staying in a static, steady state, the trend of change is going to stay in a static, steady state. It's going to continue. So for example, um, and this, is, this would be a more accurate forecast. So let's say, um, so it's, five, it's now 540. Um, let's say it was 77 at 440, and now it is 75. Using a trend forecast, okay, the temperature's cooled two degrees in the last hour. I would assume that it's going to cool another two degrees between now and 640 and then another two degrees between now and 740, and another two degrees between you know, then and 840, and so on. So every hour I would take off two degrees. The problem is, just like fashion trends, weather trends don't last. Think about that. We experience trends that shift all the time in weather. In the morning, the sun comes up, the sun gets higher in the sky, temperatures rise. Then the sun peaks, um, we reach that, that beautiful income outcome balance in the afternoon, temperatures peak, and then they begin to drop. So we transitioned from one trend to another trend. We've transitioned from one trend to another trend. Trends don't last. Trends don't last.
and think about it, and this actually makes sense. So the example I have here, let's say that, let's say today's Monday, and it was 68 on Sunday, or sorry, 68 on Saturday, 70 on Sunday. Okay, so it warmed two degrees between Saturday and Sunday. Let's assume that that trend will continue. So now it warms another two degrees between Sunday and Monday. Then let's assume that Tuesday, it warms another two degrees. So now it's 74. Then Wednesday, 76. Thursday, 78. Friday, 80. 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, 92, 94, 96, 98. Within a couple of weeks, we're forecasting temperatures in the hundreds. And before you know that, we're forecasting temperatures of 120, 125, 130. We're forecasting these crazy high temperatures. If the trend continues, it will go off to infinity. That's what's called divergence. It will diverge off into infinity. The same thing happens if we looked at cooling. Now it would be negative infinity. You would need a parka rather than, um, rather than sunscreen. So trends don't last. But again, a good example of persistence forecast, whatever's happening now is going to happen tomorrow. Whatever ha whatever's happening now is going to happen tomorrow. So you don't look at any other data points. You only take into consideration what is exactly happening now. Now with this said, trend forecasting does have one other very valuable use and you will use this in this week's module activity. And here's how it works. Let's suppose I have a city and let me draw um, a little dot and let's say that city is New York, New York. So right here, the beautiful city of New York, New York. And let me just draw an in Y for New York. Okay, so there's New York City. And let's say we want to predict whether we are going to experience major weather changes in the next 24 hours. So what we do is we look at, we only have two time periods that we're looking at. We look at current conditions, which show that there's a front about 800 miles to our west. And then we look at conditions from the previous day and we say, okay, in the previous day, the front was 800 miles further to the west. So between yesterday and today, the front has traveled 800 miles. So between yesterday and today, the front has traveled 800 miles. Well, the forecast would then say, okay, between today and tomorrow, the front is going to travel an additional 800 miles. And if I'm in New York right here, I can then forecast, okay, well, if this front travels 800 miles, it's going to pass me in the next 24 hours. Therefore, I can predict that, okay, we're going to experience a frontal passage. And then we can use what we know about frontal passages to make a prediction on our weather for that day. Um, for example, we know that when a front passes, Usually the temperature drops, dew point drops. Um, there's usually stormy weather ahead of the front, so we might get some rain ahead of it. Then the front passes and it clears out. So we can actually predict all of those things based on just a simple trend forecast. Um, and I'm actually gonna have us do an example of a trend forecast in a little bit. And it's one that you'll see much easier on this week's module activity. There are two other forecasting methods I want to mention, um, analog and climatological. So analog forecasting is basically us using the past to predict the future. The idea here is that weather repeats itself. Whatever happened in the past is doomed to happen again. And so what we do is we look at a similar setup from the past. So a similar setup from the past. So for example, um, El Nino is a good example of an analog forecast. So the, the way that an El Nino works is we can look at, okay, what did previous El Ninos do 
to our weather. What did previous El Ninos do to weather conditions? And here in California, we can say, okay, well, the last time we had a big El Nino was 1997 and 1998, so we got a lot of rain. So now it's 2015, 2016, um, and, and I'm actually recording this a few years later than that. But now it's 2015, 2016. Um, we have an El Nino, and based on the previous El Nino, the previous major El Nino, we're going to predict a lot of rain. So we're gonna have a we're gonna have a rainy year. All right, good. So that's what our forecast is based off of. Basically, we used a previous outcome. So 1997, there was an El Nino. We got a lot of rain. Now there's an El Nino, so we're going to predict a lot of rain. So again, we're using a past outcome to predict a future outcome. Here's the problem though. No two weather setups are identical. Every single weather setup, every single weather system has a different structure to it and may exist in slightly different but different enough conditions. And so you don't always get a perfect verification. And in fact, I use that El Nino as an example because 1997, 1998, California was walloped by tremendous amounts of rain, um, very stormy weather. It was, it was very epic, per se. However, in 2015, 2016, the El Nino that we received only gave the northern two-thirds of the state average rainfall. Meanwhile, Southern California remained high and dry. So it was an El Nino that didn't really pan out the way that an analog forecast expected it to pan out. And yet that whole winter, forecasters were sticking with, hey, El Nino, lots of rain is coming. And then it never came. So that's the problem with an analog forecast. However, when all else fails, it's useful. The very last resort forecast, however, is what's called a climatological forecast. Make sure that, that, that you, you listen to what I'm about to say because a lot of people hear the word average and they start taking, they start calculating averages of trend and persistence and stuff like that. You're not doing any of that. What you're looking at is for a climatological forecast, you are looking at the climatological average for that particular day. What this means is um, we, have, we have decades, decades of weather data. And what we actually do is every year, we take the previous 30 years of data for that date and we calculate an average. And that is what we call our climatological average. So when making a climatological forecast, we just plop that average in. So whatever that climatological average was, that's what we use. Now, you've probably actually heard this climatological average stuff before, but if you've ever watched a news broadcast of the weather, or if you've ever watched the weather channel, they will usually use a different word, a misleading word. They will use the word normal. So the normal outside for today is 81. But what they actually mean is the climatological average, the average conditions for that day using the past 30 years. Basically saying, okay, so we've taken the temperature every year for the past 30 years and averaged it out. That is a climatological average. And then that climatological average can then be used as today's forecast. So, okay, the, the, the average for today, the normal for today is 81. So that's going to be our forecast. That's going to be our prediction. The problem with this is think about, think about a test, for example. Let's say I give a test and I give it to 50 different students. And let's say the average, the class average is an 
So then I say, okay, well, I'm going to pull out a person's test. And statistically speaking, the most likely outcome should be 80%. If I pull out a test, that, that test should most likely be an 80% test. But the problem is, is that that doesn't necessarily mean the average doesn't necessarily mean the most common outcome. It's just an average of all the outcomes. I'm just as likely to pull out a 90 or a 70 or a 75 or an 85 or a 20. I mean, I'm just as likely to pull out any of those. And because that average is the average of a bunch of different data points. So climatological forecasts, they are a good last resort. And, and for example, um, I'm writing this, I'm, I'm doing this lecture in June. Um, I'm going camping this weekend. And I want to know, do I need to bring an umbrella? And let's say I don't have access to any kind of weather app or anything like that. And chances are it's June, it's California, it doesn't really rain here in June. All right, I'm going to leave my umbrella at home. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. When we make a climatological forecast, we basically are making predictions on what's normal, what is normally happening. So, for example, if somebody came to you and predicted snow, and you live in Los Angeles, California, you could probably laugh at them because there's no snow. So let's do an example. Um, let's make, let's make an, a forecast for San Jose for tomorrow. And here's how we're going to do it. Yesterday's temperature was 68 degrees. So this was yesterday. This was yesterday's data point. Today's temperature is 71, and tomorrow's climatological average is 82. How would I predict tomorrow's weather? How would I predict tomorrow's temperature? Uh, I should really clarify, weather isn't just temperature. It's the main variable we all look at, but it isn't just temperature. So, let, so let's do it. Um, so if I were to make a persistence forecast, all I want to look at is the now. What is happening now? I don't care about what happened yesterday. I don't care about what's going to happen or what climatological averages. I just care about now. And so whatever the current conditions are, whatever today's temperature is, it will persist. So a persistence forecast would be a forecast of 71 degrees. The current temperature or, or that, that today's temperature will be the same tomorrow. That is a persistence forecast. On the other hand, if I wanted to make a trend forecast, I now need to take both yesterday and today into consideration. Yesterday it was 68, today it's 71. That represents a three degree warming, right? Three degree warming. Uh, let me put the F for Fahrenheit. Three degrees of warming. And just to make sure that that does not look like an eight. There. Oh, I got rid of the whole thing. Forgive my little blooper. Here we go. So that represents a three degree warming. Okay? So three degrees of warming. Well, if I were to use a trend forecast, I'd say, okay, so from yesterday to today, it warmed up three degrees. So from today to tomorrow, it's going to warm up another three. Hence, tomorrow's forecast is 74. So doing persistence, whatever today was, going to stay the same. Using trend, I compare yesterday to today, I look at how the temperature changed, and that is my prediction for tomorrow. The final prediction is a climatological forecast. Now for a climatological forecast, I just take the average. So I look at whatever the climatological average is for that day. Again, I'm not averaging these two. Let me cross these out. I'm not averaging these two. In fact, 
Get these out of your head now. We, we do not even need to use these. I'm gonna cross them out. The only thing we are looking at when making a climatological forecast is the climatological average. What is the normal for this day? What is the normal for this day? And so tomorrow's climatological average is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, I'm going to predict using climatology, using that prediction, that tomorrow is going to be 82. So I just take the climatological average, plug it in. That's my forecast. Now, as you can see, um, let me erase all the ink now. As you can see, I mean, th this is three relatively simple ways to do this. And be really careful as you're doing this in, today, or in this week's module exercise. Something that throws a lot of students off, and I don't want to see it throw you off, is they think that it's too easy. And then they see this and then they go, oh my gosh, it's too easy. This, this can't be the right answer. It literally is, though. It literally is. For a persistence forecast, you're just using today's temperature. For a trend forecast, the difference between yesterday and today is going to be the difference between today and tomorrow. And then a climatological, whatever that climatological average I give you, plop it in. That's it. Now, with that said, I also want to do one other example. So you're going to see something like this as well on your module exercise. And this is where I think most people get caught up. So now we're talking about any weather systems or conditions. So now we're looking at a map here. And so this is a map. And let me put in for north just to um, exemplify that this is just a map. So since north is at the top, south is at the bottom, West is on the left, east is on the right. All right, so let's say any weather systems, any fronts, low pressures, high pressures, anything, is moving east at 200 miles a day. Now let's also predict, or let's also say that just for a crude example, let's assume that any conditions that are present here are going to move at 200 miles a day as well. So let's say whatever the weather conditions at Kansas City are, they're going to travel 200 miles between today and tomorrow. And these weather conditions are going to be the same weather conditions 200 miles away tomorrow. So basically all you're doing in this case is you are taking the weather and you're shifting it by 200 miles to the east between today and tomorrow. That's all you're doing. This is a trend forecast. Again, if you go back to that map that I showed with the front, the idea here is that whatever weather is in place, it is moving at a rate of 200 miles per day in this case. So here I say 200 miles per day. So whatever's here today, is going to be here tomorrow. Meanwhile, whatever is here today is going to be here tomorrow. So let's look at that. Let's look at some of the conditions. So let's say today, let's say I live in St. Louis. And so the, the temperature is 70. I have 50% cloud cover. Um, I have pressure of 1,013 millibars, right around the average atmospheric pressure. So let's say I've got those those three things, and let's say I want to make a prediction for tomorrow. Rather than doing any persistence or any climatological, since I know that weather travels east at 200 miles a day, I'm going to look 200 miles to my west. What's going on there? Because that's going to travel east. And so 200 miles away, Kansas City, Missouri, and I look there, the weather conditions are temperature of 72, cloud cover of 100%, rain, pressure 998 millibars. Using a trend forecast, all I would assume is this is going to travel here tomorrow. So the conditions in Kansas City today are the conditions in St. Louis tomorrow. 
And then if I want to know Kansas City's weather forecast for tomorrow, I just look 200 miles to the west again, and I look at Topeka's weather. And in Topeka, temperature of 55, cloud cover of zero, pressure of 1,020. And then whatever was going on there is going to move 200 miles to the east, and so that's going to be Kansas City's weather tomorrow. So it would look just like this. Now one of the problems though is this map only gives us some lim or gives us some limitations. Our initial conditions are here. And let me subtract or sorry, let me get rid of all this ink. And so our initial conditions are here. And so we only know weather conditions for St. Louis today, Kansas City today, and Topeka today. And we know that weather conditions move east at 200 miles per day. In this example, this isn't a set rule, in this example. And so we know that whatever's in Kansas City today is going to move 200 miles tomorrow. Whatever's in Topeka today is going to move 200 miles tomorrow. And then so we have weather predictions for Kansas City and St. Louis. The problem is we have no idea, and I'll use red for this, we have no idea what is going on west of Topeka. We have no idea. So we can't make a forecast based on this alone for Topeka. And that's actually one of the problems with some of these weather models. We only have a limited amount of data that we plug in. So that's one error that can pop up. But you'll see that in this week's module activity. The other thing that you'll see is I may ask you where are there any fronts? The way that you can do that is identify conditions before a front and after a front. And look and see if you notice any city that matches up with before a front, any city that matches up with after a front. In this case, okay, the difference in temperature from St. Louis to Kansas City, not that big. I don't think there's a front between these two. The difference between Kansas City and Topeka, on the other hand, is about 17 degrees, well, it's 17 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a noticeable difference. That's a noticeable difference. You also notice that in Kansas City, we have 100% cloud cover, rain, and relatively low pressure, we, pressure of 998 millibars. So we know that we have low pressure here, we have rain, we have clouds, and then we know that eventually this is all gonna clear out and behind it we have higher pressure and cooler temperatures. I'm betting you, chances are, there is a front between these two locations. So if you haven't done so already, go back and review conditions before, during, and after a frontal passage to identify if there's any fronts between these cities. And then, making my forecast for tomorrow, again, I just took what happened in Topeka, moved it 200 miles east, took what was happening in Kansas City, moved it 200 miles east. That front that was between Topeka and Kansas City would also move 200 miles east. That would also move 200 miles east. So that's what we have. And that is how we can do a trend forecast using different locations. Just a few more things I'll talk about real quick, a few more tools, a few more um, ways that we can make predictions. Um, some predictions are just as simple as looking outside. Um, a good example is a halo around the sun. People often say when you say, or people often notice that when you experience or when you see a halo around the sun, that means that cirrus stratus clouds are present. And cirrus stratus clouds are usually in the leading edge of a mid-latitude cyclone. So when you see cirrus stratus clouds, it means that there could be an approaching mid-latitude cyclone. And with mid-latitude cyclones, comes rain, snow, or all that stormy weather we know and love. 
So that's one way that we can make a prediction. If you notice a ring around the sun, then expect some weather changes. Another prediction, and this one is actually older than dirt. Um, there are actually ancient scriptures and, and, and ancient texts dating back thousands of years that have actually used this. And basically it's red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky at morning, sailor's warning. Here's what's actually happening here. So basically, if you see a red sky at night, that means the sun is setting in the west and the sunlight is reflecting off of a cloud to the east. Well, here in the mid latitudes, weather systems travel from west to east. And so when we have a bunch of clouds to our east, that means that any storm systems are to our east. Storm systems are to our east, and as a result, they would continue moving east. They're going to continue moving further away from us. Hence, sailor's delight. On the other hand, when you see a red sky in the morning, what that means is that the sun is now rising in the east, and it's reflecting off of clouds to the west. That means that there are clouds to the west, which means that there could be storms to the west. Hence, sailor's warning. It means that a storm is approaching. Um, these are just a couple of reasons or a couple of ways that we as meteorologists can make simple predictions, that you can make simple predictions. Um, and who knows, this summer when you're on vacation, if you see a ring around the sun, a, a halo around the sun, hey, go buy an umbrella. The very last thing I want to talk about, believe it or not, it's the last thing in this class. Why do forecasts go bad? Well, there's actually a theory called chaos theory. And the idea behind chaos theory is even the smallest change, the smallest perturbation can become much greater over time. It can become much greater over time. And a good example of this is, let's say you're skiing and Let's say you have your wallet on you and you drop your wallet. That wallet then begins traveling downhill. Now there are many different paths that your wallet could take. And any of those paths are equally as likely. And then it chooses one of the paths. And then that one path was an error. It, it, diverted from a straight path, it, it diverted. And that divergence can then result in further divergence. And so why forecasts go bad is when you make a short-term forecast, so let's say we make a forecast for tomorrow, and we say that the forecast for tomorrow temperature is 73 degrees. And then let's say the actual temperature tomorrow was 75. Well, when we make a forecast for two days from now, we're not plugging in the accurate 75, we're plugging in the inaccurate 73. So that inaccurate reading plus its error are fed into the model. That then makes another prediction that now has more error to it. And the longer out you go, the more erroneous the forecast becomes. So if I could leave you with anything else in this class, and I'll show you one other cool thing, but if I could leave you with anything else in this class, it's don't trust 15-day forecasts. Don't trust them. Now, with that said, as we have improved creating models, as we have refined our forecasting techniques, and as we get a better knowledge of our atmosphere, weather forecast models have come leaps and bounds. When I was young, and that wasn't too long ago, that was in the 1990s, you never saw anything beyond a five-day forecast. And even that was a stretch. Now, a five-day forecast is pretty decent. I can give you a pretty good five-day forecast, and it would probably verify, or it'd be close to accurate. But the further out you go, the more prone your forecast is to error, and the larger the errors are going to be. So when you're looking out 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, or in the case of AccuWeather.com, 45 days, those errors have compounded and have become bigger and larger and greater. And so you really can't trust a forecast that far out. What I usually tell people is 
48 to 72 hours is a pretty good forecast. If you don't, if you don't look at the forecast anymore for the next three days, what is forecasted for the next three days now is probably going to stay that way. But then the further out you go, the more likely the forecast is subject to change. So don't trust long-term forecasts. And please, if you do me any other favors, don't use AccuWeather's 45-day forecast. Please don't sue me, AccuWeather. Um, but no, it's just because the longer out you go, the more likely it's prone to error. Now, the last cool thing I'll show is issuing a forecast. So once we make the forecast, we now need to issue it. And I'm sure, I'm sure that you've heard these different phrases before. Oh, there's a 60% chance of rain today, or we have showers today. You hear these different words, but what do they actually mean? Well, if I leave you with nothing else, here's a little way of deciphering what they mean. First, if you have a 0% chance of rain, we just say no chance. We don't even mention it. So as meteorologists, if we have a 0% chance, we don't even mention it. On the other hand, if we have a 10 to 20% chance of some kind of precipitation, we will call that a slight chance. In that case, it's worth mentioning, it's worth keeping in the back of your head, but eh, it's probably not going to happen. It's, it's a slight chance. Then we then get into what's called a chance, and that represents a 30 to 50% probability. Here, you wanna start really thinking about, hey, it might rain today. So usually you'll hear the word cloudy with a chance of rain. Not cloudy with a chance of meatballs, cloudy with a chance of rain. And that means we have somewhere between 30 to 50%. Now, once we go above 50%, we are now in a situation where the chance is greater than the chance of not getting any rain. So we use in that case the term likely. Likely, meaning that it's definitely, it, it, it's still possible that it won't, but chances are pretty good that it will rain or that we will get some precipitation. So whenever you hear um, today likely rain, so there's likely rain today or cloudy with rain likely, that means a 60 to 70 percent chance. And then finally, if you've ever heard a time where they say, okay, um, cloudy with rain, they don't even say a chance or a slight chance or rain likely, they just say cloudy with rain. And you'll actually see this on National Weather Service pro, uh, National Weather Service forecasts, cloudy with rain. That's what's called a categorical probability. In that case, it's almost a certainty. And in fact, you're confident enough to say, rather than saying a chance of rain, which means it may happen, but it may not. Here you're saying, yeah, it will happen, pretty much. You're, you're sticking your, your neck out a little bit, but for the most part, Pretty good prediction. Another thing, um, rain versus showers. If you've ever heard these two words, they may sound interchangeably, but they're not. Actually, rain represents steady, widespread precipitation over a large region. So we are likely experiencing rain here. Our friends up in Mountain View, so I'm in Cupertino right now, our friends in Mountain View are experiencing rain. Saratoga's experiencing rain, San Jose's experiencing rain, Sunnyvale's experiencing rain. All these cities right around where I'm at are all experiencing rain. On the other hand, showers are usually off and on and hit or miss, meaning one location's getting rainfall, another location three blocks away might not be. And it doesn't usually stick around. Usually it'll rain for a few minutes, then it'll stop, then it'll rain again, then it'll stop. These are a lot more hit and miss. So if you ever hear the words rain versus showers, when you hear rain, it means it's going to be steady, it's going to be a longer duration, and it's widespread. On the other hand, when you hear showers, that usually means short period of time, on again, off again, um, hit or miss, and that's it. Last cool thing I'll show you. 
Um, if you've ever wondered why a meteorologist stands in front of a map or, or what they're actually looking at when they're waving off that map, they're actually looking at a green screen. And basically the way that this works is a camera looks at that green and anything that registers as green to that camera, it then puts the map on there. And if you notice, this meteorologist is not wearing anything green. Take a look at Google if you want to, green screen meteorologist, and you'll see so many instances where people are wearing green and literally the map is right on them. It's like they're wearing the map. But just a cool idea right here that um, you can actually stand in front of a green screen and basically the map is projected behind you. So if you ever watch the Weather Channel or if you ever watch local weather on Cron 4 or or KTVU, Fox 2, this is it. This is what's actually happening. They're standing in front of a green screen. So that's it. That's it for this module and that's it for this class. Um, I hope you've enjoyed everything that you've learned this quarter. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can message me. If you enjoyed this class, please recommend it to your friends. I'm always looking for a few good budding meteorologists and I'm always looking for more interested people. Um,